my questions from the left, and then where's my notes from here? Cool. Let me close this down just a little bit. Are we already on? We're live. <laughs> I like I. Hey guys, we're just trying to figure some stuff out. The live stream thing has been really inconsistent for us, so um, we're just doing everything we can to make this work, and we're trying to give you the best information we can as we're moving along. And I think a lot of other people are having the same issues because I've seen this uh, with not just myself. So. Uh, anyway, so we're live, is that right? I, welcome to Ken Tamplin Vocal Academy, where the proof is in the singing. And um, I just want to kind of get started here. Uh, we've got a whole hour to cover vibrato, and it's a very uh, elusive and controversial subject. So uh, I'd like to start there. Uh, but I would like, before I do that, I just want to uh, answer a couple questions from last week, because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get, you know, uh, you know t t tag tail from what's happened from the last stream to this stream. So the last one was, you know, how to sing soul, blah, blah, blah. And then we had some questions that didn't get answered. And I'm sorry, because I'm doing the best I can to get everybody's questions answered. So my goal is, um, I'd like to first start off by saying that it's a pleasure and a privilege and an honor to be able to serve you and to um, give you information that I, from life's experience, that will help you. Uh, do I think I'm God? No. But do I think I have a lot of information that can help? Yes, I do. <laughs> and I prove it. So um, first off, uh, questions from last time. We have uh, Chris Jamakis from Greece. You know, uh, where is it best to breathe from, mouth or nose? That's a good question. And um, there's two answers to it. If you can and when you can, always try to breathe from the nose. And let me explain why. When you breathe through the nose, it warms the breath and actually creates moisture. Now, if any of you that have had a cold or a flu and your nose is really clogged and you're sleeping through the night and you <laughs> and you have to get that air to go down in the trachea from your mouth instead of through the nose, have you noticed how dry you get when you do that? Well, that's really important because it identifies that there's not a lot of moisture that's coming directly into the throat and the cords and the you know, vocal folds, etc. So when you breathe through the nose, now another point to that too is if you've ever watched any boxing and uh, or other sports, and if you notice when they put them on the sideline, as soon as that round is done, what they do is they take the you know thing out of their mouth and they make them breathe through their nose. So oxygen also is a very important aspect to this as far as um, the breathing part. So hopefully this is helpful. So whenever you can, two aspects. So breathe through the nose when you can. And then when you can't, of course you can't, you're going to be running around a stage or hyperventilating because you have stage fright or whatever that is, get enough oxygen in you first and then try to breathe through the nose. So uh, how can I know if I'm on key? Well, um, that's a big question. First of all, there's a lot of answers to that, but um, you know, there's a lot of really cool programs out there where you can just get your phone out and just, you know, look and see, go, You know, and it'll it'll literally literally tell you what your pitch is. So I would suggest starting with an app because it's the coolest thing to be able to just do that. I didn't have that growing up, and we had to like um, one of the things that I did, and it's going to sound kind of silly, was I used to play my guitar, uh, and I would I we never we didn't have tuners. I mean, they were too expensive back then. So you know, you'd get your guitar out of tune, and then you'd try to play to something on the radio or on a record or cassette or whatever. And then you tune to that cassette and you'd be able to hone in on your pitch. Well, to, in today's language, you know, now there's all this technology out there. Old school days for me, grandpa, um, is that I would have to like match the pitch of my guitar and then I could relate that to my singing and listen. So th the best thing is to do is to get a piano note and hold it and go. like two propellers of an airplane that are like in sync when they go wah, 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 and they have this you know resonance that happens together so um what about the lizard tongue <laughs> thanks rachel um i owe you one rachel corn says what about the lizard tongue okay let's talk about that um you know i think the most important thing about this is that Wherever you, I'm not looking to pick fights with anybody. I'm just looking to give information, and hopefully this is good for you and whatever. If someone wants to call me out on lizard tongue, they should also call out people like Adam Lambert, because he also has lizard tongue. And I could go down a list of all kinds of people that use this. Um, 
there's a, a, a we, I'm going to, in fact, um, I have an associate, his name is Bob, and we're going to go through this, and we're going to put something out called Open Throat Technique. I know there's another coach just put something out here on Open Throat Technique. If in my singing course, I have a singing course called How to Sing Better Than Anyone Else, and I go through the stages of this, okay? And to use a term like lizard tongue, the first question you have to ask yourself is, where did the term come from? Who coined the phrase lizard tongue, okay? So, and I'm not to say that that's bad, it's just if someone doesn't understand something, then they mock it, or they try to make fun, or they try to uh, sensationalize something to the point that makes themselves look better, or they could, you know, or just whatever it is. Like I said, I'm not looking to pick fights with anybody, but I am going to share some information with you that, like I said, grandpa's been doing this a long time. So you can decide, uh, you know, if, if that person has ever toured, do they have records out? Have they placed music and film and TV? Have they worked with huge music producers and other things like that? And, and trust their information or trust mine. It's up to you. And I'm okay either way. And you can click off now if you don't like it. And that's fine. But what happens is within vocal track shaping, within open throat technique, is you first start with a, a nice open throat ah. It's the la ah ah. Now what? Now when most people start that exercise, their tongue gets really thick in the back of the throat. Okay, now I'm gonna I'm gonna do a real close up in a second, but I just want you to most people go la. See how thick and round my tongue is. La. And what we train is we train to get the tongue to lie flat to the base of the jaw. It's called the mandible the jaw. And you go la. That's the second stage of understanding or learning how to create the maximum space in the back of the throat. This is really important. In fact, it's funny, This uh, we were just talking about open throat technique. This coach recently you know, was making fun of this. It's like, make fun of it all you want. Just prove it with your own voice and your students' voices to show how the technique works. That's all I'm gonna ask for, okay? So we get it flat to the base of the jaw. When you get really good at it, and I mean really good at it, you can get it to be concave to the base of the jaw. I'm going to get gross on you, but I want you, hopefully you can see the back of my throat. Let me get up really close for a second. And I don't know if you can see that or not. But what happens is, is I'm creating maximum space, open throat technique, maximum, maximum space in the back of the throat. Now there's a lot more to it than just this. I'm just talking about lizard tongue. Okay, all right, so what we do is this, your tongue, and again, it's called vocal tract shaping, and we shape vowels predicated or based on the amount of space that we have in the back of our throat, and our tongue plays a key role in this. If we go, la, la, like some people sort of gag on their tongue as they're trying to ascend or descend a scale or a passage. Well, as we do this, um, this becomes really important because the more space we can create in the back of the throat, the more we can hold muscle memory for the vowels that we want to create. You know, just nice, big, huge, round sounds, right? And I know it's very operatic. I'm just trying to make a point. So, and then that vowel changes ever so subtly, so slightly from vowel to vowel, we don't have to go through all this gyration of, you know, la, and have all this, you know, craziness between vowel to vowel. What does that mean? It means that um, if we, all vowel sounds, if, if those of you guys that are doing my course, how to sing better than anyone else, no, all vowel sounds stem from, it's the la, ah. So I go, la, right? I just went through all the vowel sounds. And in that, if my th uh, throat stays open, then I can shift between those vowels very, in very small spaces without using huge, giant steps to get from one vowel to another, which gives me freedom to be able to go in and out of a lot of, a lot of stuff. This becomes increasingly important the, more, the higher we, we go. Now, let's get back to lizard tongue. So lizard tongue, a lot of times what I do is I use it because when I, so let's, first, first stage, the tongue, people gag on their tongue. The second stage is they try to get it flat to the base of the jaw. The third stage is they try to get it concave to the base of the jaw to create more space in the back of the throat. 
The fourth stage is that when it protrudes correctly, correctly, you can protrude it out. And you can actually create vowel spaces and all those vowel modifications that need to happen between from vowel from one vowel to another and use the tongue as it's pulled away from the back of the throat. Now imagine, it's going to be weird, but imagine, I'm going to go sideways for a second. Imagine if I could pull my tongue away from the back of my throat, how much space I'm creating in the back of the throat, right? Now, we can't create tension to do this. This is really important. So when you see someone do it, they're just like, and their tongue's like, they're gagging on their tongue. That's different. But when you're able to be relaxed enough to where you've mastered muscle memory, where the tongue is able to drop to the base of the jaw, create maximum space in the back of the throat, then when you're shifting from different vowels or trying to use it for glottal stops or, or, or actually avoiding glottal stops or, um, which by the way, glottal stops means anytime he goes <laughs> where the glottis cuts back the air and we stop and it's a hard consonant sound or something that stops air, contiguous airflow. We talked about that last week. Um, what you find is that the lizard tongue, as, as we call and it's a cool phrase, it, it, awesome. I'm glad someone else coined something that, that people will benefit uh, from if they really understand how to use it. Um, what it does is it gives you the ability to shape vowels in the back of the throat without overshaping a vowel. Now, let me explain what I mean by this. For all, and, and, I, and I know I need to get into our session. Gosh, we're already 15 minutes in. I'm talking about my tongue. <laughs> um, when, when, if you've ever seen on a sports field that what's called an agility ladder. It's the rope that they lay down. It looks like a ladder on the, on the grass or whatever. And you see um, athletes and they, they're warming up to get into the game. And they run through this and they go, and you see them run through this agility ladder. It's real small, real small spaces. Now, it's interesting, two things. First thing is that ladder isn't really big. They're not going, you know, it's they're looking for quick bursts of energy and, and, and very small spaces so that they know that they have their center of balance and they're not overdoing um, the energy that they need to do this. Well, it's exactly the same way with vowel sounds. We don't want to over accentuate the vocal tract and go like we don't want to have these giant spaces. We want Right. Notice how small and compressed that was. And we're going to have to, um, Bob, please remind me, I need to do a, a webinar on distortion. I'm talking to my assistant right now. Um, because this becomes increasingly important, the more sound pressure that we add to this, the and the higher up we go also in our registration, um, the smaller these spaces need to become. So lizard tongue provides, again, first, let's do it again, real fast. It's the la, a. All vowel sounds stem from ah, la, like the doctor wants to see your tonsils. La, Notice how little my tongue changed, okay? So, Ken, can't you sing without loser tongue? Absolutely I can. But I actually want the path of least resistance. I want to find the fastest way, or the, uh, the most concise way, excuse me, not the fastest, the concise way to get from vowel to vowel, so I'm not, I'm not expending so much energy in my tongue and my throat for open throat technique and vocal tract shaping to get me what I need, okay? So let's move on here, guys. We're gonna do some shout outs. Um, we've got uh, Anahita uh, from Armenia, nice. Uh, JB Good, uh, good morning LA, from, or good morning from LA, okay, awesome. Terry from Michigan, Antonia from Romania, good to meet you, Antonio. Uh, Lorena from Argentina, hey, Lorena, by the way, uh, we lived in Argentina for a while, it was really cool. Uh, we were in Buenos Aires, then we went down to Mar del Plata, and my son, True, actually, was a big soccer guy. So he actually played for the uh, Primavera division of Aldo Civi, uh, which was in Mar del Plata. So um, anyway, Timmins from Ontario, Canada. Uh, Miguel from Panama. Hey, Miguel, I'm in San Miguel uh, de Allente, Mexico right now, broadcasting live. Christian from Sweden. Uh, uh, Nimil from Bangladesh. Uh, Michelle from Utah. I've got someone from Ghana. Uh, let's see. Grass eater, grass eater from Wisconsin. Are you a cow? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, anyway, Sebastian from Canada, uh, Zhao from Brazil, Oliver from France. Look, it's so uh, we're gonna go to uh, Walter from Finland, Heavy Dreams from Germany, Joe from Seattle. So um, we have people from all over the world that want to learn how to sing well. 
And I'd like to start off with a couple things. Um, first thing is, is that I don't claim to have all the answers. All I can do is give you information that has cost me my life to understand how certain things work. Just like lizard tongue, and whoever created or coined that phrase lizard tongue, I'm not sure how old they are, and I've said I'm not sure how much they've toured, I'm not sure how many records they have out, I'm not sure how many songs they've placed in film, film and TV, I'm not sure how many music producers they've worked with, I'm not sure how many songs they've written for other artists, or whatever. Check them out though, make sure. Hey, have you ever toured? Hey, have you ever made a record? Like kind of start there because all information is not created equal, but I can only give you the information that I have that's been my personal experience. And so with that said, I want to get cranking on uh, vibrato because it's a big subject and it looks like, gosh, we're so late on it now. I'm probably going to go over it. If you guys are, raise your hand if you're, if you're willing to go over with me today because um, we're going to cover a lot of ground. Now, the reason this is uh, a, such a... Um, an enigma, which means kind of a mystery, you know, but people don't understand, is that um, a lot of people have a lot of different thoughts on what vibrato is. So I'd like to start first by saying, what is vibrato and how do we get it? Now, um, a lot of people, in fact, a lot of major vocal coaches say vibrato is not necessary. Well, it isn't necessary. Does it add? Does it contribute? Um, I'm going to suggest something that's going to come back and bite me in the butt, but I have to say it for what it is. A lot of what I have learned over the years has been steeped in bel canto or apoggio, which is um, operatic training. And um, unfortunately, I disagree with a lot of things. With There's a lot of things I do agree with. It's, it's one of a fantastic uh, foundation to get your voice going, and then you can branch off in other areas. Um, but a lot of opera singers default to vibrato obnoxiously. And I'm, no! You know, everything is just, the minute they hit the note, they hit vibrato. And then you get to singers like Whitney Music. And I, I will always love you. I, you know, and she just drops that note in the vibrato, and it's so sexy and so beautiful. So you have to decide, you know, and then there's singers that have no vibrato at all. We'll get to that in a minute. But, um... So you have to decide, you know, what vibrato is for. Now, I'm going to go what I believe it is for. And, and scientifically, there, there's another vocal coach who said, it's just science. Well, like I said about this dog with the skinny legs and the, and the big dogs, the skinny dog, or it's not skinny, but small leg dog, sometimes can run faster than the big dog. Or you have a, 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 an athlete that can create, do an event that's extraordinary, soccer, football, baseball, whatever it is. And no one can really explain it. They kind of, well, you know, it should have been. And uh, uh, uh. it's because we use the total body, not just the chords. We're not just taking a strobe and looking at the epiglottis and the vocal folds and this and that and going, that's how it works. Because the whole body is involved here. It reminds me of the, the Texas um, uh, courtroom scene where the judge asks him, he says, but my family's involved here, <laughs> you know, right? Well, your whole body's involved here. I don't know if that made sense to anybody. It was pretty funny to me. Um, anyway, so I want to talk about a, the, what a true natural vibrato is, but um, before we get there, again, what is vibrato and is it necessary? Does it play a role? And I'm going to suggest some things to you as a person that has toured again for 30 something, 35 years, uh, has, you know, spent about a million dollars on his voice, I am not kidding, not a joke, um, and has 40 records out, a thousand songs placed in film and TV. Ken, do you have to keep saying that every time? Actually, I do, and here's why. Just take experience from one person and say how much experience do they have in doing something, and then take experience from another person. Just ask them to prove it. It's really simple. And then say, hey, can you just sing a full song or several songs or and also songs with your students just to show that what you're teaching is legit, okay? Not something you read in a textbook, not something you're parroting from someone else, but that you can actually prove it with your own voice and your students' voices. That's why I keep saying this, because I want to drive this home. The proof is in the singing. So what is vibrato? A vibrato is a natural vibrato is the final resting place. Let's just stop there for a second. What do you mean by resting place? Okay, so when you finally land a note, a vowel, Okay, you land a vowel, it's when you land that vowel with, you know, a strongly supported whole tone. Okay, remember we talked about, you know, the whole um, 
uh, abdominal strength and, and you know everyone talks about diaphragmatic support just go watch the videos on diaphragmatic support but that strength in the abdomen so a strongly supported vowel let's say relaxing into a state of oscillation what is oscillation oscillation is when you have the note that is the root note and it vibrates okay let's think of the word just vibrate it's easy creating maximum resonance Ooh, can those are all fancy terms well they are and they're not. I just want to break it down real simply. Let's do it again. A true natural vibrato is the final resting place when we land a note, okay, that's strongly supported from the abdomen, a, a whole tone or a, a vowel, let's say. And then once that resonance happens, once we have the strength in the sound, we're not forcing it. We're not going and killing it. We're going. into a state of oscillation, okay? Now, why this is important is because once we have the strength and the mechanism and we built up the muscle memory for open throat technique and all this stuff, again, I cover all this stuff in my course so extensively, that once we relax into the state, we find that we're, we're not feeling this pressure in the throat at all. We're finding that the strength comes from the core and we're able to relax to a note that starts out with no oscillation at all and once it starts to relax, it starts to vibrate. And that vibration creates resonance in the face. And we're going to do a whole thing here. Uh, again, I'm trying to um, uh, go through systematically things I think that will help you. So we're going to do a whole thing on mask and how this creates a mask. But in mask, we bring this the resonators in the, in the front face, in the mouth, the jaw, and nose, and so forth. And we're going to talk about how that resonates and allows you the ability to relax into this state without forcing a sound, and you're all of a sudden you feel like you're floating. Literally, you feel like you're floating, okay? So there are many debates on whether the oscillation or this vibration should be above, above a whole tone or below it. Now let's talk about that for a second. It's really important. So I want you to, um, uh, before I even tell you what that is, what does that mean above the whole note or below it? How many of you guys out there have seen a heart monitor? And it you know, kind of goes, Beep, 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 As the heart speeds up or slows down, right? It never goes, right? It never goes below the line, okay? Now, I'm only using this by way of visualization, not by uh, juxtaposing or um, comparing what this is supposed to look like. Now, if it's true, okay, so some people say that, um, forget about if it's true, I'll get, let's get to that in a second. Some people say that it should be, in fact, a very, very, very famous vocal coach who invented SLS says it's supposed to be above the line. Beep. Or sorry, no, let's do this slower. What is vibrato? So vibrato is a whole tone. You hear the That's above the line. So Okay, is this going along? So that, this vocal coach says that it's supposed to be above the line. But if it's truly a state of relaxation, you're working at that. Now, in fairness, and we're going to talk about this more later, there are certain artists that do this above the fold. One is Freddie Mercury. Another is Elton John. Like, there's other people that actually have oscillations that go above the fold. But if it's truly a state of relaxation, it should be below the line. Right? Because you're relaxing into a state of oscillation. So think about, I'm going. Right now. I'm not throwing it above the line. Okay, so a lot of people just don't haven't grasped that enough to understand what I'm talking about. So hopefully that makes that clear. Um, let's move on. Um, now, in the case of a relaxed, fully abdominal supported, um, it, whether it's below the line or above the line, <clears throat> I'm not suggesting that we can't have different vibratos. And I want to get into that in a minute because um, people have made entire careers out of the way they <clears throat> have their vibrato. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, but, but I want to talk about exactly what, where this vibrato should land, okay? Now, some people have, we're going to go to wobbles and we're going to go to, you know, all kinds of different types of vibrato in a minute. But if I have a vibrato that's really wide, 
like you're going to throw a cat through a hula hoop. I mean, it's pretty annoying and obnoxious if it's your style and it's something, um, is, it, is it truly a natural state of relaxation a response uh, for a state of residence? No, it's, it's stylistic. Um, is it bad? Well, I mean, it just depends. It's you're, you're, you're actually using a style. Please don't call that true natural vibrato. Just say it's a style that you like and you're going to you know, move into that style. So I'm going to go into all kinds of different types of vibratos. Um, and it can, and also, this is all, also can be um, uh, a key to determining one's vocal health. And let me explain that. Um, I don't want to name names because I don't want to get in trouble, but there's a lot of artists as they've gotten older, you can hear their voice move into a wobble. And they have these you know, big wide vibratos. Whereas when they were young, it was and it was nice and, and compressed and pretty. And, and, and as they've gotten older, it's, it, you know, it's, it's become wobbly, old man, old woman wobbly. So you can actually listen to a vibrato and really determine the health of one's voice. That's really important. So now I want to get into effects. So, but before I do that, I want to discuss different types of vibrato. Okay, first, diaphragmatic vibrato is characterized excuse me, by diaphragmatic pulsating during a sustained tone. So in other words, I don't want to go into the details of all this, but it's when they take their breath and they... <laughs> and they're they're using their diaphragm to create the vibrato. Well, that's not natural. Um, but I will confess to you that within a lot of Herculean roles within opera, like big sopranos and big um, tenors, they will use that for a dramatic response. <laughs> Have these giant, you know, vibratos. Well, that's for more for a dramatic effect. I don't know again because um, it pr produces sort of a tremolo effect, and I'm not sure that uh, you know, depending on who it is, um, that that's necessarily their natural vibrato, but they might be using that for effect. Okay, so it's not healthy. It doesn't determine anything other than the fact they're just using it as a natural effect. There's a vocal trill vibrato. It's often taught through training uh, to try to match pitch, pitches and tones, playing on guitar or piano or whatever. Um, and, it, and they toggle between half or full steps. Well, that's actually kind of more like a wobble. So um, the, my personal vibrato for myself, for example, and by the way, everyone's vibrato is different. It's their signature of their, their natural voice. So it doesn't mean that everyone's vibrato should be the same. I'm just pointing out that these different types for a second. So I'm going to get to the wobble. It's like a wobble. So what they'll do is they'll toggle between a half or a whole tone. So or you know, whichever above the full or excuse me, above the line or below the line. So, but that's pretty big. So, or if they do a whole tone, that's a pretty doggone big vibrato. Um, and it's usually slower um, than a healthy vibrato, so they'll do they'll do it um, to where um, it's almost like randomizing error for their pitch. Here's what I mean by that. So if I go, hey, can you really tell where my pitch is? So what it's doing is it's kind of subterfuge for uh, which means hiding or um, covering up you know, absolute pitch, okay? Uh, but it's used all the time. It's just, it's not healthy. And, and there's much less pitch differentiation between this giant toggle and where the sweet spot should be. Instead of, it should be, so that you can still identify the pitch. It's not just usurping all the space, you know, within a whole tone or a half tone, right? And you're able to kind of go, oh, that's beautiful, and I can really hear it, and it's not just like, wow. Okay, laryngeal vibrato, which is um, a di different type, is vibrato from the larynx, which is the voice box. Not a good idea at all, because the voice box should be, I don't want to say, uh, everyone says it should be neutral. No, it's not neutral. That's a bull crap. Absolute bull crap. 
the, the larynx changes all the time when we sing and it moves up and down in the throat. That's by the way your voice box. And I, we just discussed this in fact on the last, uh, uh, last session session. Uh, maybe I should do a whole thing on just the larynx, stability of the larynx and how that works. Bob, if you can remind me of that too, I got my assistant Bob. We're trying to like, as we go through this stuff, give you guys good information. So I'll try to remember uh, to discuss this. Anyway, but it should stay somewhat stable. So um, now people have been called out like Whitney Houston or Steve Perry or all these guys that they use what's called gospel jaw or jaw vibrato. And I Now, I want you to know something. I'm going to show you something real quick, right? Here's how you can identify that. Now, Whitney grew up in the church, and so she learned some pretty cool stuff just from an organic sort of thing, right? Same thing with Steve Perry, like we discussed last week and I've discussed many times. Sam Cooke is one of his favorite, biggest, greatest influences. Now, watch this for a second. You hear that? Okay, that's gospel jaw. Now, if I go... And if I want to move my jaw in the process like Whitney or Steve does, and I, I will always love you. Right? She's combining her natural vibrato with entertainment or with something that is helping her feel like she's able to, you know, accentuate this natural vibrato. So please, for you uh, vocal coaches out there that I've heard Whitney called out and Steve Perry called out all this, all this stuff on Gospel Jaw, that's bull crap. Listen to their natural vibrato first. They're not going, yeah, 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 yeah. They're going, ah. and then they and then they shift the jaw after the fact. I feel like that's more for entertainment value, like hey, yeah, 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 yeah. you know, people that have you know some entertainment. And I've done it myself and I still do it from time to time because uh, it feels good and it's fun and you know, whatever. But listen to the natural vibrato first. This is really important. Next thing here is caprino vibrato. Now caprino um, in Italian means a goat like or goat's wiggle or little goat's wiggle, little goat actually. Uh, this is a fast and nervous sounding vibrato. It's like, <laughs> you dirty wabbit, <laughs> right? And we hear this from singers like Stevie Nicks, you know, uh, you'll be standing in a line, you dirty wabbit, um, right? So, you know, there's this super fast vibrato and there's lots of people that use this. It's not just Stevie, I'm sorry Stevie, I'm not making on you. But there are other people that use this also. Stevie uses it because that's how she felt that that was the best. By the way, it made her millions and millions of dollars. So folks, if you think that this is all bad, it's not. I'm just discussing vibratos right now. Um, but then there's groups like Manhattan Transfer. And one of the things that's the coolest thing ever is, is if you have the ability that you've grown your vibrato enough like me, uh, to where you can do all these different vibratos and you know how they feel and you have built enough muscle memory for this that you can move into different spaces and create these vibratos for effect. Know your own natural vibrato first, the natural resting place when you're hanging a note to show how, you know, uh, what your own personal signature is for your voice. But I'm going to use Manhattan Transfer. And I love, you know, um, he's kind of tall, and he's sweet. And they go, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. It's like a horn set. Right? That's cool. You know, it's just cool. It's a fact. It's man transfer. Like, you know, I'm not worthy. You guys are awesome. And then you listen to their natural vibrato. You go, oh, okay, you're just using this as some cool effect, you know, to make this work. Nothing wrong with it. It's awesome. Now, the tremolo vibrato has a faster oscillatory rate. And it's usually wider than a natural vibrato. Um, Aaron Neville does this. There's lots of guys that do this. In fact, um, yeah, I'm going to get to some other singers here in a minute, and then we're going to open up this up for, for some questions. But the tremolo is, you know, and it's really wide and thick. But if you listen to Aaron, he's so sexy when he does it. It's like no one calls him out, you know, on, on a tremolo vibrato. And tremolo is like, by the way, I'm being careful not to sing other people's songs because um, YouTube has been cracking down a lot on um, 
uh, using other people's music and stuff and without permission or finding if it's available and this and that. So I would sing a song by that and I would sing a song by all these artists if I could, but I'm just being trying to be careful just to give you the style so you understand it. Look up Aaron Neville when you can. Just amazing vocal. I mean, you know, it's, it's I want to put that on when I'm having dinner and I'm not thinking about his vibrato. I'm just thinking about the, the warmth and the... Um, just the sexiness of the sound is the best way I can say it. Um, now, a natural vibrato, though, is where what you can hold this note and relax in a state of oscillation. It produces greater volume with, uh, in singing without adding extra press, uh, pressure. So that's what we call resonance. So when we talk about resonance, it's you're able to get louder with a natural relaxation response without pushing or, you know, whatever. So we work, and by the way, I've heard this said by so many vocal coaches, it's crazy. Well, you know, you don't, vibrato is natural. You don't have to work at it. What? Let me say that again. Vibrato is natural and you don't have to work at it. I don't know. I've had to work for everything I've gotten. So if that person woke up out of the womb and went, you know, you know, and they woke up with that vibrato or, you know, out of the womb with that vibrato, good for them. I'm not worthy. I've had to work for, for all of everything that I've gotten, including vibrato, and it didn't come easy. Um, so I want to get started on, you know, how we how we start with vibrato, like how do we get it, um, and then uh, how do we get, make this natural to our own unique vibrato or our own signature for our own voices. Well, first thing is, is that um, in my course, I have this whole section called, uh, how to, you know, it's the la-ah, and it's the biggest vowel, and we start with that vowel to be able to grow open throat technique. Well, actually, it's the exact polar opposite when we come to vibrato, and let me explain why. The ah vowel is too big. I'm not saying it can't be done, but it's easier to start with smaller vowels. So you guys that are out there with me and you want to start with this, so let's start with an oo or an o or an e. So if you go, Right? You start oscillating, and I'm going to suggest below the line, go ahead and try. You can do it that way too, right? But I'm suggesting start on an U vowel, start in your lower register. The higher up we go, the more difficult it becomes to maintain that vowel until we've got this relaxation response, and then build the A vowel. That's a subject for a whole other day, right? And I cover that in my course too. But so we start with an U or an O or an E. So, Now, again, I'm not doing this in my throat. This starts at the abdomen. So I have a good, strong, supported whole tone or vowel. Let's go to E. So, ooh, oh, E. E. Okay. And I relax in this, this state. Now, let's do this. Go real high with this. Go, I'm going to go on an ooh vowel real high. Ooh. Right. If you notice, I don't have a bunch of pressure here. It's just that I've been able to relax into a state of oscillation. Let me do it again. Really look at my throat. Watch this. Right? I don't have like all this added pressure. It's just that I built up enough muscle memory and strength. Now, we get there too, by the way, guys, by doing a lot of different exercises that we go through first that I also cover in my course. I don't mean to keep plugging the course over and over again. I'm just making the point that um, you have to, there's a, a, a sequence by which all this is done and you have to follow a sequence in order to get to these places. So anyway, so now we're going to talk about different vibratos and what, what I want to point out here is um, I'm not suggesting in any way, shape, or form that these guys are bad. I'm going to talk about Jesse J. I'm going to talk about Barbara Streisand. I'm going to talk about Celine Dion, Bruno, Bruno Mars, Rihanna. You know, they, they're a whole lot bigger than Ken Tamplin. I'm just giving you information. This is my own personal experience, and I believe that my experience supersedes a lot of other people's experiences that teach this stuff. And I, it took me a long time, and I, and I took vocal lessons from uh, coaches, many, many, many coaches, not just one, because they have a lot of conflicting information, and compiled this in my course where... All of these singers, I've taken vocal lessons from the coaches that taught these guys many times over. I want to start with Jessie J. And the reason I'm doing this is um, she's super awesome and she's doing some cool stuff. Now, Jessie has a really, well, you'd think that it was a caprino vibrato. You'd think it was this, you know, super fast. That's actually her natural vibrato. 
If you really listen to it, she's not, it doesn't sound like, a, you know, a goat's wiggle. It's her natural vibrato. Same thing with Barbara Streisand. She uses a lot of nasality in her sound, but her, her, her sound, and, and look some of these guys up. Come on, guys. I, I spent the time putting this together for you. You spend the time researching some of these people. But Barbara Streisand, old school, um, you know, and a woman in love, I do anything. You know, and she's, I'm trying not to sing too much of it here because I don't know if I'm allowed to put it out there. But anyway, so you listen to, to her vibrato and you just go, wow, that's really cool. Same thing with Celine Dion. Now, Celine Dion does have a little bit of both. She's got a little bit of Caprino and a little bit of natural vibrato, you know, natural vibrato. Now, Rihanna is, that's a character voice to me. It's, it's not a natural sound. It's what she's chosen, and, and she's chosen it. Like Aaron Neville, she's chosen to have a faster vibrato. Bruno Mars, um, pretty doggone good. He, to me, is like, you know, Michael Jackson is alive with vibrato. <laughs> you know, he's come back um, and done some really nice pieces in it. I, I don't know about all the techno stuff that he's done, but, you know, uh, all of the, you know, sitting naked on a piano, meaning naked vocally, uh, and, and bashing out some stuff, When I Was Your Man, and all those songs. Nice stuff, man. Really nice. Dio. Last in line. Now, he admitted, Ronnie James Dio, famous uh, heavy metal vocal singer, uh, recently passed, um, that Mario Lanza, very famous uh, opera singer, was one of his favorite, you know, growing up, his parents used to play this in the house. He was a trumpet player at the time. That's how he got some killer lungs, too, I believe. Um, and uh, he developed, a, let's call it a gothic, not even gothic, but just like a metal version of Mario Lanza's vibrato, or just his open throat technique, and he just did it by listening, you know, which is really cool. Mariah, great, great vibrato, just a really great technical voice. I'm sorry that she's going through some issues today. Um, I want to talk about Maria Callas because uh, uh, she's a famous uh, female soprano opera singer. Um, she's got the ability to morph her vibrato in all kinds of different ways. She can uh, have a fast vibrato on, on, in one at one moment, and then when she comes down and settles in, she'll slow it down for effect, and 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 so she's very versatile and just a, a, one, probably one of my all-time favorite um, sopranos. So look her up, Maria Callas. She's just phenomenal. Pavarotti, of course, we all you know. Uh, you know, he's got that kind of perfect, big, fat, uh, Herculean sort of sound. So, Billie Holiday and Ella Fitzgerald, I'm going to cover those two. Um, they, in the jazz world, um, there was a lot of fast vibrato. And you can't really tell. I think it's natural because it came to them so naturally. It sounds caprino, but there's a lot of opera uh, singers that do this too where they're able to settle into a fast vibrato, but if you really listen to it, it's not like Stevie Nicks where it's, let's say, it has that kind of sound. It's, and it's not like, it's not that. It's, it's somewhere in between the two, but it sounds so natural. I suspect um, that it is a natural vibrato, though it's really fast. Aretha Franklin, you know, uh, looking out in the pouring rain, perfect vibrato. I used to feel so tired. You know, just perfect, beautiful vibrato. Aretha, we miss you. Amazing stuff. Thank you for inspiring me. I just can't tell you that you inspired me so much. Crazy. Um, we talked about Freddie Mercury. Now, Freddie Mercury was above the fold. Now, a lot of people, you know, praise his vibrato and stuff. Freddie admitted himself that, you know, he, he was a, a hack when it came to certain things. A monster orchestrator, monster singer, monster performer. But there are certain things he meant, he said to, um, uh, what's a guitar player, one of my favorite guitar players, uh, anyway, I'll think of his name in a minute, uh, of Queen, he said, you know, hey, I'm no Paul Rogers, you know, don't try to make me out to be like Paul Rogers from the band Bad Company. And so uh, it was interesting because he was sort of admitting his own deficiencies in certain things. So Freddie couldn't really control his vibrato. It was incredibly, beautifully, beautifully emotional. It was very theatrical, but it wasn't a controlled vibrato, and he did, uh, you know, a vibrate above the line. So I wouldn't use him as any kind of example for great vibrato. I'd use him as an example as a phenomenal artist that took over planet Earth with his voice because he was so passionate and so crazy about what he did. Same thing with Elton John. Uh, to me, Elton, please don't get mad at me for saying this. 
Um, he's a singer-songwriter. I never thought of him as a great singer, uh, though he's a good singer. Um, he's no he's no Aretha, you know what I mean? So he's no Pavarotti, he's no Maria Callas. So, and he would admit that. I think he'd be the first to admit that. Um, though, again, he's sustained five, five decades of singing, um, and many artists have lost their voice over time. Uh, you know, phenomenal entertainer, phenomenal songwriter, great, ha had the ability to take his voice to carry across his songs rather than writing something for someone else and having someone else do it. So now let's talk about people with no vibrato. You've got guys like Sting, for example, you know, you know, uh, uh, every move you make, I'll be watching you, you know, no vibrato at all. Well, he made a career on that. Same thing with John Anderson from the band Yes. I don't know if you remember that band. But then you get to like really sexy, sexy vibratos like Luther Vandross and you go, okay, well, would I rather have, you know, um, or what I'd rather hear. And, and roll into this sweet thing that also provides a platform for greater volume, a pointed resonance in order to be able to have a relaxation response so that we can control the sound in emotional and fantastic ways. So anyway, with that said, um, I just wanted to uh, give you, a, you know, and this is a bird's eye view of all this stuff, guys. We walk through this in my course. I take you through a whole way of how to create this vibrato, when to do it, what vowels to use, when to ch transition those vowels into other vowels in order to be able to open it up to the ah and the ah and the a. Ah. So uh, I'd like to open this up to some questions. Um, Kenny Stearns, uh, my, vibrato, my vibrato has always been too slow, uh, so I don't use it. Can you increase the speed of your vibrato? Absolutely, you can increase the speed of your vibrato. I just did it. Um, now, too slow uh, usually means that it's not really well supported, and that's fine too. Um, like I said, if you don't like the sound of it, you should change it up to something that you do like, but it sounds to me like it's not a natural vibrato. Uh, Sahar, uh, where should we vibrate? Where, where should the vibration take place? Uh, can we do it in our chest? You know, that's a funny question, and I've heard that a lot of vocal coaches, that vibrato vibrates in the chest. No, it doesn't. Vibrato is in the glottis. It's, that's why it's called vibrato. It's vibrato, and the, the folds are actually vibrating. It's the, the chest is, let's move it from the chest down into the diaphragm and the abdomen. That should be the strength that, hey, it should be the strength that sustains the vibrato from down here. Off-topic questions. We're going to move on here because we only got nine minutes left and I want to answer as many questions as we can. Um, Arca, can you tell me when I reach a uh, high range, my vocal tone starts to sound false. How can I make this a full tone? Okay, Arca, what I'm going to do is, have you? I don't know if you've seen my uh, video on belting um, and I have quite a few of them out there. Maybe I should do a video on this. It sounds to me like you're, you're um, flipping into your head voice and I want you to think of something, Arca. And I try to get my students to think of this. I'm going to try to consolidate this question here. When most people flip into their head voice, they were either taught that or it's just something easy for them to um, uh, roll into their head voice and not you know, go into what's called the call register. Okay. Now this becomes important because if you don't build a chest resonant sound first and understand how far you can take your chest, chest voice, call register, and then hand it off later into um, a falsetto or you know a reinforced falsetto or head voice register, um, then you've never you've ne you're going to forever sentence yourself to defaulting early with you know so you say instead of so we should do this think of someone stealing your bike or your car or your purse or your phone you know hey that's my bike yeah hey oh that's stop that thief right. Think of this in terms of how you can take your belting register as high as you can, and we need vowel modifications so that we don't oversing. And I've covered this here, and it's in my course again. All this stuff's in the course, um, where we develop develop that first. Then we develop our head voice. We bring it down to the chest voice. We fuse them together. And we can go into one long, powerful note. And then, then eventually, when we build this together, then everything sounds like your chest belting register, or you can pull it back and add air uh, and, and different derivations or flavors or shades of that. So, uh, JC Rogel, volume one. I want to know how, how loud it is okay to sing, and should we rely on compression too much? Okay, first thing is, is 
it's not about the volume. The volume should come naturally by resonance. So if you're doing volume one, and by the way, uh, 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 JC Rogel, um, we, at, we answer all these questions in my singing forums. So if you want to have a more uh, comprehensive answer to this, please post something in my forums. By the way, I have a singer's forums, guys. It's got thousands and thousands of singers in there, great moderators answering all your questions. You can post this stuff live with your own voice so you can get honest, direct, legitimate feedback in order to be able to answer this. Yes, you can compress it too much, and it depends on how you're compressing it in the throat that matters. If I go, ah, that's a form of compression, not a good one. Is hey, that's a form of compression that's a good one. Here's a bad one that has no compression. Hey, where you're blowing too much air in order to, and it, like I said, takes a flamethrower of air across your vocal folds and will dry them out quickly. Antonio, uh, should I keep my abdomen tight while trying to breathe through my diaphragm? Okay, again, if you've seen my video on diaphragmatic support, this is important. You absolutely have strength in the diaphragm when you're singing a note. And once you're done with that note, you relax the diaphragm completely. Even get your hands in there and kind of massage it and go in there like, you know, get it loose so that it relaxes enough to be able to give you the strength to go up for the next note. Now, I like to use this analogy. I've used it before. I'm going to use it again. Think of a guy with barbells, okay? And let's pretend we're working out and we're, you know, we're doing reps with barbells, right? Here's blah, blah, relax. Relax. No, it's not like, here's my resting point. I'm going to hold on to this. I'm going to hold on to this for the rest. Right? And as we do this, if we don't relax the abdomen, it gets bound up, and then we don't have the strength or the freedom to be able to go in and out of a great um, a breath, a diaphragmatic breath. So, K, uh, Morth, Morthcrofty. <laughs> Martha, I'm not making fun of your name, it's just a mouthful. Um, is there, uh, is there, should be, are there any other techniques than the la a ah for building your belting voice? Well, you know, um, yeah, um, you could go to a, like le, but um, remember, all vowel sounds stem from it's the la a. Ah. And if we don't use that as the platform and have that be the vowel by which all other vowels have to stem from, then you're setting yourself up for a lot of moving targets as you're going to start to learn the voice. And, and it's like a plane, when a plane takes off, or it's going down the runway. If you're using it's the la a, ah, the plane takes off and goes straight, and you can decide where you want to go with the plane. If you start off with the A vowel, and you're going over here, or the E vowel, and you're going over here, you never know what true north is to get that plane off and running, and then be able to shift those vowels from vowel to vowel. So my suggestion is, you start with it's the la a ah, first, and then you migrate to other vowels. If you have questions, go into uh, our singers forums, and by the way, the, the note splats rather than soars. Okay, that's because you're not using, um, let's do this whole thing one more time, Kay. Are there any other techniques than the la a for building your belting voice? I end up getting so loud of thinking in my head, the notes are so massive, the note splats rather than soars. That's a term that I've created, by the way, splats, meaning it gets too top heavy and it gets too big to sustain the note. So that's where your vowel modifications come in. So if you're doing the course and you're going through your vowel modifications, we close down those vowels as we ascend and then reopen them as we descend in the scale. And if you're doing that correctly, then you'll find that you're able to close the sound down and it doesn't get so big top heavy. Let me give you an example of what I mean. If I go, hello, just too big. Let's do ah with correct vowel mods. Hello. La, a, u, uh, and u. And I went all the way to u to close the vowel down so it doesn't become so top heavy that I can't control it or sustain the sound. So you have to do that first, and then as you do that, you'll notice that, you're, that, that that's not going to happen to you. Ashwin, can we implement vibrato uh, to the uh, falsetto register? Absolutely. I just did it. Sure, of course we can. I suggest you start low in your, um, your low chest resonance sound first. That's going to really help you because it's going to help you identify how to get vibrato clean and clear. And then you can translate that into... So if I... Ooh, or, ooh, 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 right? I can translate them both. Start in the chest register first, then translate it uh, on into the head, head or falsetto register. 
Sahil Gayan. Sahil Gayan. Uh, when I try to sing, the sound will come to my nose, uh, not to the front of my mouth. Please tell me what to do. Okay, so depending on whether or not it's called a viola nasal port or, you know, just your nasality. So depending on um, how you normally speak and what your uh, normal uh, singing registration is within how much viola nasal port you're using, I suggest you try plugging the nose. I kid you not. And try plugging the nose, not just doing your, your nose plug like this and you can't touch it. Right? But try to get it to where you, when you plug your nose, as you go through a scale, let's go. Right? Now watch this. I'm going to do extreme. I'm going to go. Right? Or I'm going to open the back of my throat. Now it still does sound a little nasally, like I've got a cold or something, but it wasn't like the one before it. So, la, la, I'll do both together. La, la. Did you notice a very little change in the sound? Because I'm not bringing so much sound through the, the, the nasal cavity and I'm trying to maintain a good um, open throat technique with contiguous airflow coming out of the throat in order to maintain that sound. That'll actually help you identify how not to sing so with such nasality. Uh, what's the best way to hear yourself to stay on pitch while practicing full volume or, uh, or recording? Uh, do you recommend a, a separate monitor channel? Hmm, I'm not sure I understand the question. What's the best way to hear yourself stay on pitch while practicing full volume or recording? Well, to me, that's a couple of, those are two different things. One, if you're practicing, I'm not necessarily using headphones or anything, I'm just practicing. Um, if you're practicing full volume or recording, well, we should always practice full volume, so I'm not sure what that means. When I record, um, uh, I'm assuming that you're probably using headphones all the time when you practice, I think that's the question. Um, you know, you can practice with headphones on. I'd recommend you start without them just so you get equilibrium in the room and you get a lay of the land in the room. That's really important. Uh, and then when you practice um, you know, with something, you should be able to practice with some tone, uh, you know, meaning a piano, guitar, or whatever, where you can sing into that. Now, um, the, the dilemma here and the challenge is that there's something called the Doppler effect that happens when we ascend a passage or phrase or you know sing high and that is that the higher we sing the more sound pressure we build in our heads let me say it again the higher we sing the, as we go up the scale and sometimes louder the more we go up the scale we build sound pressure in the head now I've said this before I'll say it again I want you to try an experiment for you that have the technical ability to do this I want you to put a pair of closed back headphones on and I want you to hear what music is playing in the room. Now have the music playing in the room at the same time, fairly loud, but put the headphones on. And when you take the headphones off, there's a Doppler effect. You know the car that goes, the ambulance or the police car that goes by? Well, that's the same tone. Their tone didn't change. It's just it changed in relation to you when it moved away from you, okay? So why this is important is when you build sound pressure in the head, you take the headphones off, you know, let's say, um, just a small town girl, and you take the headphones off, just a small town girl, all of a sudden, it's lower in pitch. And you're like, what the heck? Did something change? No, the, what changed was the relationship of the pressure in your head. Now, we're, I'm in a room like this, and it's a big room, and every room is different. With ambient pressure, or pressure in the room, ambient pressure, it's pretty much the same because the room, the, the amount of space in the room isn't going to change that Doppler effect that much from just the actual sound that you hear. How that change relationship happens is as you ascend the scale, the scale itself within the head compresses and you think you're getting to a note, but you're actually flat to the note because you think you're hitting a certain note. So you have to... Uh, uh, condition yourself to knowing what that note is supposed to sound like and knowing the placement of that note and where you're supposed to come in at in order to be able to work that and get good intonation for that. So I hope that was an answer to your question, JB. Um, Corey Garcia, can someone who smokes still be a good singer? Well, I mean, you can ask Adele that question. <laughs> um, but of course you can. Is it optimal? No. Will it kill you? Yes. Um, 
is it going to affect your vocal folds? It'll make them like leather over time. So my suggestion is try not to do that because it's not going to help you over time. Uh, musical box, how to use like Paul Rogers, the vibrato and overdrive techniques. Well, you know, if you look at most of what I do, that's what I do. So if you listen, to, if you get my course or you uh, listen to some of the other videos and stuff that I have, you know, baby. By the way, this is going to be kind of funny. We were talking about uh, laryngeal positions last week. And, you know, he uses a raised laryngeal position. Him and, and like guys like Glenn Hughes and uh, Paul Carrick, you know, from Squeeze. Um, baby. When I think about you, I think about love. He's got this kind of raised larynx. It sounds like a frog, but it's really cool because we all like Paul Rogers, or at least I do, right? And then he goes, feel like making love. And the minute he goes up, wow, he drops the larynx and he's got this roaring lion sort of sound. So he's been able to manipulate his vibrato in with a raised laryngeal position and also with a lower laryngeal position. So, and that's true for Paul Carrick, you know, tempted by the fruit of another. And he's got that really great, sexy sort of thing. Listen to that song called Tempted by Tempted or Tempted by the Fruit of Another by the band Squeeze, and you'll see what I'm talking about. But the minute he goes up, he has to drop the larynx because if he doesn't, then all of a sudden he gets caught and he loses range. Now there is an exception to this rule, and I'm gonna use Glenn Hughes as an example, you know. Hey, yeah, you know. A, They'll laugh when she said burn hair. Hey. You know, he's got that real kind of, uh, you know. So there are people that can get away with it, and I don't recommend it. Uh, it's cool for effect. Um, he's a better man than me because I would do that once in a while for effect. I wouldn't do it all the time because I'd get locked up here. Um, anyway, Michelle, um, I can sing, but I have issues with confidence. All right, Michelle, yeah, I'm, I got a whole thing coming on stage, right? We'll get to that, sweetheart. Um, it's a tough one because the, the way we do this is, and I'm, we're, we're going to close here in a minute. But the way we do this is we start out singing to our pet, our cat, our dog, ourself in the mirror, whatever. And then, and then we migrate that to our brother and sister that hopefully won't make fun of us. And then we ask our family if we can do something in front of them. You know what I mean? Uh, we, if you're old enough, uh, you go to a uh, open mic night or you go to a karaoke thing and you just try it a few times. And if you're really brave, you'll start busking and you'll go out and you'll start busking in front of people and you don't really care what people say. Or you can also put it on the internet. However, uh, people on the internet are far less than gracious um, and they make fun of people and they tear people down just because that's that gives them entertainment. So I'm not so sure that I'd recommend that. Maybe post something and just in confidence put it unlisted and ask your friends if... Um, what they think, and then you can start to build confidence in things. You know, it's funny, I hated the sound of my voice when I was growing up. I didn't care about it at all because, you know, I wanted to be Jimmy Page. And it was, you know, only sort of later that I found out that, you know, I needed to get this so I had more control of my career and my life to learn how to sing well. So last question, and then we're going to, um, oh wait, Luke Taylor says, do the famous something. I'll see what that says in a minute. But Joshua says, when I lower my larynx, there are two muscles that push out in my neck, is this normal? I don't feel like it affects my sound, but is it or is this just creating space? It depends on where in the neck it is. Uh, we don't want pressure in the lower part of the, of the larynx down here, and we don't want pressure here. If you're saying that your Adam's apple, which is your larynx, you can actually see it start to drop, that's normal. But I'd have to see a picture of that, and you can post that in my singing forums to um, Oh, uh, Luke, sorry, do the famous Chris Staple uh, lick for us again. Tell you what, um, what I'll do, Luke, is I'm going to do a whole series on that. Um, you know, I'll, I'll do a whole uh, uh, a thing on licks and tricks. So we, uh, that's a, that I'll, I'll use that maybe as an opening to um, a webinar I'll do on licks and tricks. Okay, guys, thank you for joining me. Ken Tamplin Vocal Academy with the proofs and the singing. Uh, really appreciate everyone attending. God bless all you guys. And I will be seeing you um, today's what? Saturday. I'll be seeing you next Wednesday. Same bat time, same bat channel. Until next time, peace out.